Could I just check that you can see the uh, uh, screen? I can see the screen perfectly, Mario. And it, is it the PowerPoint screen of the title? Yeah, it's the landing screen, yeah. Perfect. All right, then. I'll, we'll go silent for 10 minutes and then... Thanks a lot, Mario.
Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mario Novelli uh, and I'm the director of the Center for International Education and co-PI of the Peer Network. Uh, welcome everyone to week six of the Peer Network lecture series, The Political Economy of Education in Times of Conflict, Crisis and Pandemic, a GCRF AHRC funded network between the Center for International Education, University of Sussex, the University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan, and the University of Ulster, which aims to promote engagement with critical political economy analysis of education in contexts of conflict and crisis. The lecture series is also supported by UGFIET, the UK Forum on International Education and Training. Um, all of these lectures are live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards and will become part of a free open source resource for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge and practice about the political economy of education. Uh, please sign up uh, to our CIE YouTube page uh, and uh, follow us uh, and all of the previous lectures. Um, I'm very happy to say that today's session is led by Dr. Yunus Omar and Professor Azim Badrudian from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And the focus of this session is towards a political economy of education and conflict in South Africa. Um, Yunus and Azim uh, are leading uh, in the GCRF project on the Africa hub. And over the next three years, we'll be doing a range and leading on a range of uh, training workshops and, and the commissioning of a range of research uh, projects around the region. Um, before I introduce them, I just want to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules uh, and logistics. Um, please mute yourself unless you're asking a question in the Q&A. Um, please ask any questions during the talk through the chat function and I will collate them and send them back uh, to the speakers. Um, uh, and we'll call you back to ask the question later on. Um, Eunice uh, will be doing the main presentation and both Eunice and Azim will come back for the Q&A. Uh, he will talk for around 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll follow that with a seven minute Sussex buzz where um, I'll set up breakout rooms where you can discuss in smaller groups some of the key issues that have emerged uh, from the presentation. We'll then come back as a group for a plenary question and answer session. Um, we'll try to finish promptly around quarter past two UK time. Uh, now for just a short introduction of the two speakers. Uh, Yunus Omar is a latecomer to the Academy, having spent most of his working life as a public librarian and an English and geography high school teacher. He completed a postdoc with Professor Yusuf Syed, then Sarchi Chair in Teacher Education, and Azim Badrudian at the Center for International Teacher Education site at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, where he worked on a number of projects on the political economy of education in South Africa. Yunus currently teaches in the School of Education at the University of Cape Town. His research interests include teacher resistance under conditions of oppression and the intersection of history, education and violence in societies. Azim Badrudian is Professor of Education Policy within the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities, University of Cape Town. His main expertise is that of an education policy sociologist and the enactment of education policy within education and training practice, institutional provision and in the workplace, with an intellectual preoccupation with youth, race, conflict and criminalization and its political economy intersections with education, social welfare and community development. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for, uh, for doing this uh, session today and also um, for being such wonderful partners in this great initiative that we are now undertaking. Um, I'm gonna now stop uh, my sharing, screening share, and pass over to you, uh, Eunice, to begin the lecture. Mario, thank you. Uh, thanks for that very generous introduction. And thank you to everybody who's joined us here this afternoon. Um, our, our topic uh, uh, this afternoon is called Towards a Political Economy of Education and Conflict in South Africa. 
And we want to emphasize that this is a cursory step towards uh, working in the Africa Hub on this project. And what we are attempting to do is to add a, an historical perspective on what political economy work in education can uh, effect. So thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Um, in terms of political economy analysis tools and the kind of framework that, you know, that we're working in, uh, we want to emphasize that PEA generally examines underlying factors. Um, they may differ in focus, but we normally examine factors that shape individuals and collective behavior and political processes and outcomes. Uh, we share uh, common components and tools across PEA analysis. Uh, for the purposes of this afternoon's contribution to the lecture series, we focus on a specific um, aspect um, of structural features of a political economy analysis. And we look specifically at um, looking at an historical legacy approach to education in South Africa. Um, as part of the uh, political analysis tools, historical analysis is part of that. And this series and this lecture this afternoon um, or this contribution hopes to add to this underdeveloped area in some form. Uh, Clifton Kreis um, indicates uh, that to witness Keith and Kin dying of poverty is the worst um, uh, humiliation. We're at our weakest, he says, and at our most powerless and vulnerable when we cannot help those for whom we can, for whom we care, when we cannot help those attain food, water, and the shelter necessary for survival. There's a sense of injustice and of abject failure when our children perish from malnutrition and disease, or when the old, the sick, and the innocent are left behind on roads and paths leading away from epochal violence and crisis. The, uh, the role of education in the present is often um, framed as uh, a key mechanism uh, through which social, social solidarity can be uh, effected. And the spaces in which that occurs are public schools as places where foundational values and social norms are meant to be developed and produced. It is within that context then that we seek to understand the political economy analysis through an historical lens uh, uh, this afternoon. In terms of education, it is through education that uh, people deal with past injustices at various levels, leading to the beginnings of healing. Um, and so when we talk about schools in the present, our take on political economy and our particular contribution to this lecture series is to take a step backwards. Um, we are guided by this in terms of a, um, a contribution in a, a previous webinar at the launch of the Southern African Review of Education uh, Special Edition uh, on COVID-19 in August this year, in which Professor Marie Brennan indicated that perhaps looking at COVID-19 needs to be looked at in its broader historical context. This uh, particular contribution today uh, takes that as a point of departure. So what is the origin of education in schools in South Africa? We know that uh, the first school was established in 1658. Uh, it was a slave school uh, and it was a school for slaves and it is couched in a managerial necessity uh, frame uh, the person who set up the school was someone called Jan van Riebeek. Um, Jan, uh, Jan van Riebeek holds iconic status uh, in South African history. Uh, we have a statue of him on or near the waterfront uh, in Cape Town. And Jan van Riebeek describes um, what the school was supposed to be doing in his own diary. And he, he writes the following in that diary. He writes, the sick comforter Peter van der Staal of Rotterdam, uh, Peter van der Staal was his brother-in-law, has been entrusted with the task of giving them, the, that is the male and female slaves, instruction in the morning and the afternoon, besides his duties of visiting the sick, particularly because he, Peter van der Staal, reads Dutch, 
and he reads it well and correctly. To encourage the slaves to attend and to hear or learn the Christian prayers, it is ordered that after school, everyone is to receive a small glass of brandy. These are slave children are to receive a small glass of brandy and two inches of tobacco. All their names are to be written down and those who have none are to be given names, paid or unpaid, young and old. All this is to be done in the presence of the, of the commandant, Jan, uh, Jan van Riebeck himself, who will attend the school for a few days to put everything in order and subject these people to proper discipline, signs of which are already apparent. In other words, the, the educational foundations of the Dutch East India Company, uh, also called the VOC, uh, it's a Dutch acronym, at the Cape was to prepare slaves to serve their masters efficiently. And out of this emerges the ideological foundations of education in South Africa. And so the core objectives, you know, to recap is to re-socialize slaves to ensure their subordinate uh, status. And crucially, they have to unlearn what they bring in from their communities. They've got to be taught Dutch, they've got to be taught Dutch culture, they've got to be taught the, taught the Dutch worldview. They had to accept the Christian religion. And in 1682, it was made compulsory for slave children to attend. They had to go for instruction twice per week. In other words, the origin of compulsory education is for slave children to be re-socialized and to be inducted into subordination to their Dutch slave masters. M most, if not all, of indigenous history has been wiped off uh, the map, uh, especially the early literatures around, around South Africa. And what in fact sits in this, in this literature is a European allegory of resilience and virtue in the face of the savagery of the indigene and the abomination of this creation. And so what we want to do this afternoon is to do something that says, let's take these taken for granted issues that we normally talk about as a, uh, a glib sentence or two, and then we move on to an analysis of education. We, we want to pause a while at Jan van Riebeck. We want to pause a while at the Dutch East India Company, and we want to pause a while at 1652. The issue of the Dutch East India Company is that in the late 19th and early 20th century, writings began to emerge explaining the origin of the Dutch East India Company and its transformation from a policy of self-defense uh, in terms of their colonial um, empire seeking at that point uh, to an issue of despoliation of the enemy, which is a crucial shift. Now, this is the Dutch East India Company that we normally recite about. In 1652, Jan van Riebeck was sent by the Dutch East India Company to Cape Town to establish a halfway a house, a garden for passing ships. The previous quotation indicates that we've got a very different view of this benevolent Dutch East India Company. When we begin to read that uh, the purpose of the Dutch East India Company um, around 1603, as we'll indicate now, shifted the Dutch East India Company as a mere company from one as an instrument of commerce into a, a simultaneous instrument of war. In other words, in 1603, when, when this ordinance is passed uh, in the Netherlands to establish the fact that the Dutch East India Company is allowed to wage war, we need to hold that into account when we think about the Dutch East India Company sending Van Riebeek to Cape Town in 1652. This is not a benevolent commercial company. This is a company that is an instrument of, of commerce and of war. And so we have a very different way of looking at empire and education at the Cape. And so when we look at the, the, the introduction of formal education, it is really important for us to think about this not in isolation of the savagery and the brutality that was meted out, especially in the East Indies, 
uh, around the 1620s and the 1630s as the Dutch forced their way through Portuguese and Spanish um, markets um, in that arena and that theater of commerce, which then became a theater of war. And so the first contact then uh, in South Africa is one of the indigene meeting these representatives of commerce and war, but it is simultaneously a moment of education. And this is something that we want to drive through this, you know, th um, through this presentation today. If we shift a little forward, uh, Muhammad Adhikari indicates that as this Dutch East India Company settlement begins to uh, articulate itself into something a lot more permanent, the colonists begin to organize themselves into what are called commandos. Uh, the first of which is organized in 1676 against the indigenous Khoi Khoi of the southwestern Cape in which Cape Town is located. Racism, says Adhikari, was an inherent uh, determinant in the violence visited upon the indigenous son and the Khoi Khoi. Um, in a very uh, infamous um, piece of writing, uh, commando leader Adrian van Jarsveld indicated uh, and using a racial descriptor when he does this to indicate that there were 46 Christians and 31 Hottentots who were involved in a skirmish. In other words, we begin to see the naked racial epithets passed onto the indigene as opposed to the identities of the colonizer. In other words, racism embeds itself and situates itself as a bedrock of the inhumane treatment and the extreme violence in the words of Adhikari visited on the indigenous peoples of the Cape. Um, settler racial attitudes um, moved on some 150 years under colonization and in a particularly useful insert here, showing that there was some element of pushback and always the complexity of a non-linear uh, colonial narrative. A magistrate in Eitenacher, or Jutenig in 1805, said this with some sardonic um, elements present, and I quote, according to the unfortunate notion prevalent here in my court, a heathen is not actually human, but at the same time, he cannot really be classed among the animals. He is therefore, and he's talking about the defense doing this, he is therefore a sort of creature not known elsewhere. His word can in no wise be believed, and only by violent measures can he be brought to do good and shun evil, unquote. It is clear then that the, for the Dutch, Slaves should be educated for subservience. They should be made servile through violence, um, as per the commandos, etc., uh, through the other Dutch colonial forces that then landed and consolidated the occupation at the Cape. But at the same time, schools were crucial for the establishment of hegemony and for domination of the oppressed. What's, what's very crucial to understand at this point is that the education at this point is already differentiated between those for the white settler children and for the indigene. They are educated differently for different roles uh, in the Cape Colony and the Cape society. And so it is important for us to note that as colonialism embeds itself uh, in, you know, in, in South Africa, as we move you know, towards the early 20th century, education by the state is only for white children. And education for the slave and the indigene and the black population is left to the church. Um, and this is a fundamental point that we want to return to later. However, as apartheid consolidates itself, there's a radical shift in the way the state begins to shape itself in relation to education. As race is inscribed on the South, on the South African landscape um, after the coming to power of the National Party, education is now seen as a, as a direct and fundamental process of subject formation, uh, according to Sodin. Uh, 
in contrast to the earlier period when it was actually not a priority of the state. In other words, here, the state no longer leaves education for the native to the, uh, to the church. It takes education as central to its ideological state formation. And so we can look at South African history and say, well, they, they were written out of history before, the indigene, the slave, and, uh, and children born into that kind of society. But this was hardly the case. And part of, and part of coming to terms with this, with this history is a burgeoning, a small but burgeoning literature that begins to isolate and begins to articulate a counter narrative. So in Cape Town, and we focus on Cape Town because we looked at the settlement, uh, the first colonial settlement in South Africa being in the Cape. We look at in 1937, for example, the emergence of something called the New Era Fellowship. This is taken from a new text by Professor Crane Sodin called uh, The Cape Radicals. The Cape Radicals uh, drew largely on uh, on you know on uh, on immigrants uh, from you know, just from the north, fleeing fleeing pogroms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, from Russia, Lithuanian Jews, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, settled down in you know, in Cape Town, and what they formed, what well, what these people in you know in Cape Town formed was an alliance of ideas with people coming in the sophisticated views of socialism, et cetera, et cetera, a new thinking about how human beings can, uh, just can transcend the labeling that, that is inflicted on people across the world, but more particularly as we speak about Cape Town in South African circles. This new era fellowship begins to disrupt prevailing ruling class thinking in the most sophisticated ways. Who, you may ask, is this New Era Fellowship and the people associated with it? Well, outside of the Cape Radicals and uh, a few theses, nothing much has been written about these people. Uh, Crane Sodin uh, writes, and, it, um, you know, and I quote from the text, none of the major histories pays it any attention whatsoever. And that forms part of the kind of issue that we are attempting to address today, this absolute amnesia about historical thinking into the present as it may influence what we attempt to do to set a right, uh, a world that is absolutely uh, inverted in terms of justice. The important issue here is that the New Era Fellowship uh, composes largely but not exclusively of teachers. Uh, these are teachers drawn from the black and colored uh, um, classes. And what they do is that in their living, in their daily living, they exemplify the, the discarding of racial identities. They attempt in their work, in their writing, and it is extensive. They attempt to show that it is possible to live as a full human being without the epithets of racial savagery in, you know, inflicted on them. There are, of course, contradictions, and I hope that this will be picked up in the, in the Q&A uh, about the role of teachers and the class formation and the alliance to the working class from which they spring, but their burgeoning emergence into the middle class. Is there misrecognition? Is this movement then doomed to fail by virtue of its misrecognition of its entry into the middle class? Of course, what then happens is that ideas like these, anti-racist ideas like these coalesce, they move sometimes in very contradictory ways with major movements like the African National Congress, the All African Convention, etc., etc. And what then happens is something that much of the world uh, was witness to. Those of us who saw this at first hand witnessed that, but we were not able to see this. I've been lenient and patient. Don't push us too far. Don't push us too far. Good evening.
A general state of emergency has been declared throughout the country. The state of emergency took effect at one minute past midnight this morning. This afternoon, the state president told a joint sitting of the three houses of parliament that he'd taken this step because he believed the ordinary laws of the land were inadequate to maintain public order in the prevailing circumstances. The measures published today give wide powers to the security forces. They are empowered to enter premises without a warrant and take steps they deem necessary for the maintenance of public order or safety. A ban has been placed on the taking of unrest pictures without the permission of a commissioned police officer. As this steps up, and this is in 1985, five years in, we enter a period of the release of Nelson Mandela from, you know, from prison. We see the release of many of the ANC, uh, you, know, pers you know, persons in prison of the Pan-Africanist Congress, many of them who's, who, still you know, who still languish in jails. Uh, um, Azapo cadres, et cetera, et cetera, are all released um, on February the 2nd in a major pronouncement. This moment signals in terms of the hope uh, for South Africans, the possibility of emerging into a world, in the words of the NEF and, you know, and people like those elsewhere, of being able to say that we can emerge as full humans, realizing our full human potential. Instead, and uh, we hope that this will be debated in the Q&A, we have a rainbow metaphor what what rainbowism does in terms of Sodin's writing is that it embeds the idea of a South African of a South African identity in the post-apartheid era, still only being available in stark racial terms. Now it's important to understand that an historical view, a, an historical political economy analysis of education in South Africa notes that this rainbowism and this uh, still clinging to race is prefigured in narratives of Van Riebeek, of Rhodes, of Jan Smuts, uh, Henry, Hendrik Verwoerd, Foster, P.W. Botha, F.W. de Klerk, etc. What we've got to understand is that writers, for example, like uh, Thiel, who was one of the great historians um, of, you know, of education, of, uh, you know, social history and political history in South Africa, indicate that it's not nice to speak about, it's not pleasant to speak about uh, black and white relations. Yet that language, that language carries over into, into the new South Africa because we carry black, white, Indian, colored, etc., into the new South Africa. Arguably, we've got to be able to understand very, very clearly that the current narrative of South Africa as it attempts to wrest its way out of the enormous challenges is beset with a basic problem is, you, you know, in that, and I quote Sodin, the current narrative of South Africa rests on this basic algorithm of race that has been inscribed on us from 1652. Uh, Clifton Kress, indicates that it's very nice to think about rights and it is useful to think about rights. These are largely meaningless in a world of systemic insecurity. He argues that the world that we've inherited, this world of poverty for the vast majority of black people in this, in this country didn't emerge out of nowhere. It emerged out of early colonial rule. Violence produced South Africa's first poor. And what we've got to think about is that if we ignore violence and simply reduce it to a sentence or two and then move on in our studies, we are missing a huge, huge, huge lesson from history. We've got to be able to think, says Chris, that a history of violence recognizes first and cherishes the thousands who perished. Secondly, a history of violence and a recognition and insertion into our work also recognizes the world that is bequeathed to us by that colonial violence. Thirdly, says Chris, a history and a cognizance of a history of violence offers us alternative ways of thinking about the past, about land, about politics, about history, and about moving forward in a post-South Africa, in a post-apartheid South, post South Africa, to the ideal society that we all wish for 
in South Africa and beyond. Is the past irreversible or are we going to retain our ideological blinkers in terms of the non-interrogation of race as a key marker of what it is that South Africans identify themselves through? Um, Nico Smith uh, indicates that Hen uh, Hen uh, Hendrik van Voort, uh, who became the prime minister uh, of South Africa, indicated that um, he wanted to implant the concept of apartheid so deeply in society that no future government would be able to undo what had been done. That is our challenge and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Eunice, uh, um, I'm going to assign everybody now uh, to breakout rooms uh, so that we can uh, reflect a little bit on the content of the uh, presentation, reflect on some of the educational implications of that uh, in the past to the present, um, and then come back for uh, Q&A in about uh, 10 minutes. So I'm going to split you into a range of groups. And uh, if you're left in a group on your own, I'll move you automatically into uh, a smaller, uh, a, a, a more, um, a bigger group. Cool. Let's see, okay. 
You brought uh, you brought Yunus up in mid sentence, Mario. He's no, uh, uh, well, he, he'll have plenty of time to respond. Uh, okay, a bigger group. So, okay, um, I hope that that gave you um, a bit of a chance to talk in smaller groups around some of the issues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Yunus and Azim, uh, for a, what I think was a very erudite and uh, a very strong insight into the historical kind of drivers within contemporary South Africa. Um, I'm going to open it up now for questions. I can't see all of you on the screen. Um, so if you want to ask a question, could you just put an X in the chat? Uh, and let's open the floor to questions, uh, discussion points, additional information. Please don't be shy. Uh, I have a range of questions myself, but would much prefer to hear yours. Embarrassing pauses. Um, Mario, uh, Prof said, is fixing. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, we've got Yusuf. Uh, over to you, Yusuf. Hi. No, I'm just taking the chance because nobody wants to say. <laughs> I put, uh, we had a very good discussion. Thanks, Eunice and Azim. This is an amazing paper. And I think it's good to talk about violence in a historical way and to go. But Several questions, I guess, stood out for us in our discussion, and I'll articulate some of them I thought in the other members of the group who were part of. One was, what is the interrelationship, and I think you say it at some point, between race, class, and gender in the historical narrative, when you're looking at the new Arab fellowships, you know, were they all male, were they all particular racial groups, how did race, class, gender, and sexuality and other forms of inequities interrelate in that particular moment? And secondly, the framework which I, we like a lot is, you know, understanding violence of today uh, historically, but when is there a continuity with the past and when is there a break with the past? You know, the violence of the present might be largely class-based in South Africa with racial inflections. And the violence of the past is largely racial-based with perhaps class, in fact, depends how you want to argue it. So it's a question of intersectionality and it's a question of, you know, the historical method, both as continuity and disruption, but also the, value, the issue of, you know, the new Arab Fellowship is really interesting but it's quite small and it doesn't change the overwhelming historiography of the dominance of the, the structural dominance of a very strong colonial and racial political elite with the levers of economic power able to pigeonhole. I guess those are the kinds of issues. I know probably, sorry if they're not clear, but hopefully they help to oh, get perfect. the conversation started. But thank you for that amazing Paper. And uh, before you respond to that, um, I just wanted to add um, uh, another question, which was that um, you, you began the presentation talking about the way that uh, education was integral to the colonization process and was brought in, but um, transformed itself from a church responsibility to a state responsibility and at the end of your lecture I was waiting for you to come back to education and to say how is this manifested in the contemporary South Africa for those of us that are not in South Africa um, and don't know so much about uh, the content how is it that those legacies continue to reproduce inequities violence uh, division so if you could say a little bit about that. And now I'm going over to Vanessa, uh, who has a question. 
All right, thank you very much. So actually I was in the group with Yunus and Azim and then I asked the question already, I think um, Yunus was about to answer just the moment we were brought back in the main room. So I'm going to ask again the same question. <laughs> so so actually, so as you mentioned in your presentation, Yunus, that um, South African identity is only available in racial terms. So I was wondering currently now in South African um, education system or education um, itself, is it like fueling that that inequality in terms of national identity, you know, construction among the youth, or on the other hand, maybe it's um, playing a unifying role to you know to bridge those um, unequal um, like racial inequalities. Um, I think I, I, I'll be very interested to hear um, about that. Thank you. Okay, you fire away, guys. Yeah, I promised to give Prof Badruddin the first bite of the cherry. Uh, he now looks extremely busy writing down questions. Um, I think to start off with the, you know, the interrelationship of class, race, and gender in the non-European unity movement. Thank you, know, thank you Prof Sayed for that question. Um, it's beset with a host of contradictions. Um, the issue of the unity um, you know of the non-European unity movement, which you know, which then arises out of the uh, does out of the New Era Fellowship in the 1930s into the 1940s, is masculine. These you know these are males. Uh, Bill Nasson describes him you know as males with a towering personality with this great uh, affinity for history and this great uh, freewheeling rhetoric. And so what's important here is that these are blind spots, complete blind spots. While they access, uh, you know, the Soviet literature, um, they do not seem to access Alexandra Kollontai uh, and people like those within Lenin's, you know, within Lenin's circle. Um, and this clearly has to be a blind spot that has to be questioned very, very deeply. Is this by design? Is this the kind of paternalism that then rankles in terms of patriarchy? Uh, it, it has enormous, enormous consequences. And so the issue of, um, you know, gender then as one of the blind spots. The other issue which we partially picked up was, you know, was the issue of class. Uh, the New Era Fellowship um, always suggested that they were sprung from the loins of the working class, but they do not. They do not appreciate, um, as, you, as you know, as Sodin writes in you know in the Cape Radicals, they don't fully appreciate the fact that as they move into this middle class existence as teachers, they need to hold close the physical, emotional, uh, material ties with the working class which they do not seem able to do. They do it rhetorically, but they're not able to do it in manifest ways in terms of uh, a coalition, a broad coalition with the work, working class. And this is manifested, for example, in, you know, in the issue of the non-European movement, which, is, which emerges from the NEF, boycotting very, very popular political um, actions uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, the train boycotts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera which arguably loses them tremendous traction, but more than the traction, it loses credibility in terms of the fact that they are no longer associated with the working classes that they purport to be working alongside with and talking with rather than talking for. Uh, in terms of class, I think um, class and race at that point uh, are two counterpoints because they take a very, very strong anti-racist stance it is, in fact, the greatest contribution, uh, in my opinion, uh, to the debate um, at that point. Uh, they fall very heavily in terms of uh, um, uh, class and gender, in, you know, in terms of the blind spots. And that has enormous, enormous consequences right, right up to the present, when the most progressive are, some would say, willfully blind, and some would say unintentionally blind. The jury is open on that one. Um, in terms of the framework, Azim, do you want to take the continuity, discontinuity, in terms of the past and the present, perhaps? Are you referring to Yusuf's question or Vanessa's question? Uh, yes, Sorry. yeah, yeah. I think it is prof, you know, this Prof Said's question. Yeah? Okay. Look, it depends on how we how we engage with this whole issue of past and present. Um, if we want to, uh, to, to um, in a sense, uh, engage with the contemporary period and we start looking at uh, what is happening in the contemporary period, what are the key 
uh, drivers be behind education and education change in South Africa. Then we are looking at issues of, of uh, finance, commerce, um, where does the money come from, who is the, the money coming from, um, who gets access to it, um, who, um, who, who drives uh, 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 the, the key ideas behind policy, uh, for whom and by whom. And so that's the contemporary issue. What, we high, what we're trying to highlight is that you have to seek the origins of some of these ideas uh, in the past. And when you see, uh, uh, if we start with the idea of race being born out of violence, human beings in South Africa and the identities being born out of violence, being shaped by violence and being organized by a form of education that, that uh, positions them to experience life in a particular way. Then you can start seeing this, this idea between um, in the violence of empire and the violence of commerce coming together uh, and framing how, how individuals experience uh, education. And so if you, if, you, if you want to think of it in terms of race and class, then I suppose we can separate it out. But I think we need to find a much more um, a nuanced way of, of getting at the human subject that is not simply classed and raced at all times, but to see the violence that they've been subjected to from at the, both the, uh, the, the racial level and the class level. And, and then to find a way into understanding how they get access to current education. So yes, the break with the, uh, the uh, past and the present, I think it's far more than just between uh, when, when does race take a back seat and when does class take a front seat. Um, and, and Eunice, if I want to, uh, if we want to, I'll, I'll let you answer the question by Vanessa. But I think this is uh, a part that answers uh, Vanessa's question as well. It's, it's about if, if in South Africa we have um, citizens from 94 that have that whose life trajectories have been framed by a racial identity. Part of, of, of the Rainbow Nation was about how to recognize these identities how to bring them together and how to make them speak about each other as a nation. But when they are so unequal, then it's hard to form a, a common identity if you're going to recognize the, the previous racial identities in the way that, 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 that we did in 94 in South Africa. I'll let you just answer the rest of that question. Yeah, I think it is really useful to think about how people frame themselves in the, you know, in the post-apartheid period as students uh, and as other people living in, you know, in, you know, in society. Clearly, it's not only racial, but because the education system and because access to everything is, um, is pivoted, I suppose, through the lens of race or through the lever of race, um, the one of the key things in a in a society riddled by the kind of inequalities, um, you know, as South Africa is, I mean, called the most unequal society on the earth by Time magazine and the World Bank, is that I suppose a back to the wall identity becomes something that one is used to and that one is accustomed to. And the inscription, the depth of the inscription of race in terms of our identities is, is so severe that I think the under theorization of that depth of inscription, you know, often leads us to a set of analyses that doesn't take race as a key factor, right? I'm not suggesting here, and, you know, need, you know just, and neither is Azim, that race is the only factor, not at all. But if one is to be asked about the South Africanness or about uh, a primary sort of identity, because we are still geographically, um, you know, completely uh, separate out, outside of a little stratum of the black middle class and those who can aspire to that, we still live geographically separate. We are spatially separated. Uh, we speak different languages. I don't speak the indigenous language, the languages of this country. I speak an imposed colonial language, English. All of these things impede the possibility at this moment of, a, of superseding these identities. And so we're saying that class, race, and all of these coalesce in the most severe ways. But if one were to ask somebody, what is your identity? They will not say the, the working class. Uh, 
they will not say, I, you know, I come from the middle class. They will say, I'm formerly black or I'm black, depending on how progressive or not progressive we are. We have a case in South Africa where a teacher, for example, a principal, aspirant principal, applied for a post um, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And he indicated on his application form that he was a black South African. And he was going to be formally charged with a crime for misrepresenting himself because he wasn't black, said the authorities. He was colored. But he's been part of a movement for 10 years that says, I disavow race as a marker of my identity. I am a South African and I'm a black South African because I'm not part of the former settler colonial uh, uh, cater of people. So I hope that goes some way to explaining some of the difficulties. Uh, it's not a comprehensive response at all, but it does throw up, I, I hope, some of the kind of complexities that uh, our students and our teachers and parents and everybody else goes through. Thanks. Um, Mario, the church and state, if I can just talk to that for a second. I think we've always had the church um, looked at as a, a cauldron of possibility for, you know, for the indigene and for the native uh, in South Africa. Without mission schooling, uh, we wouldn't have had uh, people getting access to the kind of education that, that, you know, that people had. Nelson Mandela, um, our own Neville Alexander, et cetera, et cetera. German mission schools, uh, English mission schools, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there is this, uh, the complexity of the colonial moment is that it both um, allows missionaries and people to come in and disempower people. But at the same time, it affords people the possibilities. And those possibilities afford um, an aspect of resistance that, that then permeates uh, successive generations. In the present, um, church schooling is allowed, you know, it's always been allowed in terms of independent schools, for example. Uh, we have public schools, just to explain the structure, we have public schools and we have funded schools called independent schools. Outside of that, we've got private schools. The church has always been seen as part of the independent sector, but it also, uh, the South African Schools Act allows um, a, a communities of interest to establish schools for themselves. And it can be along religious grounds. It can be around other kind of community um, identifiers. Mostly it's about religion. So we have Jewish schools, Muslim schools, we have Protestant schools, Ang just Anglican schools. What is significant about this is that you have a class a structure within this mission schooling or within the church schooling still that mirrors the broader uh, um, tiers of schooling. And so all of these play their roles in perpetuating inequalities, granting access to those who have. And so instead of it being an equalizer or leveler, a lot of these mechanisms, even in the post-apartheid South African state, uh, perpetuate these inequalities unintentionally at times. Thanks, Mario. Okay, um, I have... Uh... So I think you've addressed Jack Pretorius's uh, question around the relationship between church and state, uh, education and the, st and, and the church. Uh, so shall we pass over to Nimi first and then Janice? Nimi, over to you, are you with us? I am, I am. Thank you, Yanis and Azim. Um, um, please forgive me if, I, if my question or my comment is um, is irrelevant because I came a little bit late, but um, I was thinking about, you know, um, to talk about violence is to talk about healing, is to imply the, is to imply healing and to talk about healing in our context in South Africa is to talk about justice. So one way of thinking about this is, is, uh, is to invoke the great figure of Neville Alexander <laughs> and I, and I rem you know, and, and to return us to the thinking of one Azania, one nation. Okay, and to say instead of instead of racial equality, we don't want racial equality in South Africa. What we want is to destroy race. We actually are going to destroy race. Let us make that our political project. And how do we destroy race? We destroy race by destroying the material foundations of race. So in the education sector, what does that mean? It means outlawing private schools. It means a social movement to make private schools outlawed. It means a social movement to say no school fees. Not one school in our country will charge school fees. 
It means um, a social movement to say a child doesn't have a right as to which school it goes to. It's a random allocation, right? Those are very clear kinds of politics that we can pursue. And I'm wondering why are we not pursuing those politics, Eunice? Okay, and Janice? Hi, now my question was actually uh, kind of on top of the one about church and, and the state. And just, I was thinking around in terms of the religious identity of people and how that affects uh, the way that things are played out today. For example, South Africa, the majority of the population is black. The majority of Christians in the country are black predominantly. And of course, from the very beginning, as Eunice touched on, the missionary schools, that was very much a colonial and political um, drive where it was, let's give you the Bible and we'll take the land. So the churches were actually pretty wealthy there. And then it moved into um, in the anti-apartheid movement where we really saw militants in the church movement, in the clergy, you know, with... Um, people like Beers Nordia, Trevor Huddleston, and then in the Cape, um, Busak, et cetera, where they were actually uh, very militant in the way that they were standing up against schooling and schooling in South Africa. So how does that affect people today with a very strong uh, religious identity where in some ways are they not still being indoctrinated and subjected to a lower way of thinking through their religion is, is probably a bit of a contentious question. But the other question I have is really related to gender and gender-based violence, which is highly, highly prevalent in South Africa. It's probably considered to be one of the worst in the world and how that has translated out of colonialism where we've had the male subjected to being the boy, but going home to be the man in the house and how that is impacted in some way into the thinking through generations into where we're having a complete surge of violence in our country perpetrated against women and children that has that historical background. So perhaps um, Eunice could just comment on that. Great question. So over to you. Yeah, perhaps we can start with the, you know, with the question that Nimi poses. Why on earth are we not uh, pursuing the politics of dismantling race in all its manifestation, in, you know, in all its manifestations in the country? Uh, open, you know, open the Judy's out. Um, you know, let's start with Eunice first. It's a lack of uh, action. It's a purposeful sitting on my middle class uh, rump. And I think part of the issue is that we've never, ever been able to organize properly um, since, you know, since 94 uh, in relation to a sustained vision of what South Africa ought to be. And so <clears throat> when one enters into alliances, I think at, you know, at the get-go uh, with some of the most potent uh, formations that can drive social change, uh, trade unions, et cetera, et cetera. And that goes into alliance with the state at that point. Uh, it's a really difficult situation um, because it engenders a kind of silence that is not very critical um, because we want to give the new state a chance. Arguably, I think um, along that path, um, it's to return to a question about the figure of Nelson Mandela, for example, something that was asked in the, you know, in one of the breakout rooms. What's this, what does the figure of Mandela mean for us in the present in thinking through the dismantling of the racial capital uh, uh, framework that we emerged from in 1990 and 1994? And it is ambiguous. It's, you know, it's an, it's a highly ambiguous legacy, but we also have to factor in that the world was changing. 1990 was, was the end of the Berlin Wall. It was the end of the Soviet Union. It was the end of funding. It was the end of ideological uh, alternatives in one sense. And I think we sit in the situation where we've accepted 
uh, tacitly uh, the neoliberal framing um, of all of our lives. And people find it very difficult to understand that there is a possibility for a different world. And therefore, ideation is absolutely crucial. Uh, but we have yet to map out the ideal in ways across media scapes, for example, that would isolate people like Neville and Neville, you know, Neville Alexander. Uh, people do not know the term Azania. In the 80s, it was on everybody's lips. Uh, 2020, people don't know who Neville Alexander is. Uh, people who work in the Neville Ale you know, Alexander building, students, have to be taught about Neville, and this is part of our job. Um, I think maybe you've posed something that, um, yep. Yeah, um, sharpens uh, a determination and a you know, political project in all of us. Um, in terms of, you know, in, you know, in terms of religious identity, Janice, I think it's under theorized. Um, I think part of this political economy series of lectures attempts to say that we need to surface um, a whole host of factors that haven't really always been factored into political economy analyses. Um, there is no doubt that, um, that the specter of a religion, if one wants to look at it that way, or the lived reality of a religious identity is pivotal to many. It's pivotal. Um, in many senses, it is progressive, but in many senses, it is a defensive, it is a reactionary identity. Uh, when there's nothing else to, you know, you, when there's nothing else to fall back on, that religious identity becomes something that we hold on to, something like the racial identity in South Africa. What we ought to be doing is to think about this, I think, in ways that speak to what the contributions are, but also not, not neglecting the issue of what the potential breakdown is when one clings to these identities as primary identities. But again, I want to surface the issue that it is the absence of a super identity that supersedes all of these categories that bedevils the task in terms of asking people to think about the fact that we ought to be letting go of some of these identity markers in pursuit of a human identity, a classical human identity in the broadest human terms, uh, you know, to which all of us can aspire. Um, does it cause a breakdown in post-apartheid South Africa? Muslims flocked to Muslim private schools. Um, they feared the public school system. It's, you, know, it's a, you know, it's a generalized statement, but this is what happened in our communities. Uh, people clung to these identities. Uh, it could be seen as wanting to be Muslim or wanting to be Jewish or wanting to be Christian. Arguably, it was about class because these were private schools. And so religion becomes a proxy for bypassing the public school system and entering the private schooling system. And because it is legitimate, you know, people are able to ride this kind of wagon. Um, I'll stop speaking and let Azim um, share, you know, share some of his thoughts, if I may. I'm not sure if there's other questions, because I think we're running out of time. So I, I mean, the, the point I, I want to just make there, uh, Janice, is um, in terms of political economy, um, this under-theorization of, of the role of the church, uh, we, we often see it in a, in a structural form, but we, what we lose sight of are the, the metaphors that are embedded in, the, in various spaces. So for instance, the concept of mercy, where, uh, how, how was the concept of mercy is instantiated in the, in, the, in the church schooling sector or in the mission schools and how it played itself over into the public schools and how it's been now sucked out of the public schools, the whole concept of mercy itself that then um, this intersection between uh, um, religious and secular schools uh, comes undone by, a con by, by the uh, release from this word of mercy, this concept of mercy. It's something that uh, one, of my, 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 um, one of my colleagues um, is, is trying to unpack around how, how do you think about mercy and political economy at the same time? But the point I'm trying to make here is that we, we need to, there's some, there are key metaphors that we are not going back to and, and re-theorizing. The concept of violence itself as an overt, as an overt form, in its overt form. We, when we see violence, as in, in the video, we see violence of policemen beating, beating kids. We see uh, violence being perpetrated on, on, on others. What we don't see is the structural, the symbolic, and the cultural forms of violence 
the, the less obscure forms of violence, that if we don't understand those, then we, we don't quite understand how education uh, takes a more militarized form in, in, in particular societies, how, how education um, is framed in a particular way in a modern society or, or, or postmodern society, if you want, um, that, that, is, that presents it as, as uh, something um, whole and wholesome, but it actually is in, has frames uh, embedded within it that we haven't begun to unpack yet. Did you want to uh, answer the question around the gender-based violence that was mentioned? Is that part of the... Yeah, if I can have a stab at that one. Um, when we did some work in the Eastern Cape, um, in, in some of the deep rural schools, um, you know, at site with, you know, just with Prof Yusuf Said and with Mario and, you know, and others, Part of our questions to, you know, to teachers in the Eastern Cape in those deep rural areas were how does masculinity, you know, the trope of masculinity play, it, you know, play itself out uh, in terms of peace building uh, and social cohesion work uh, in terms of schooling. And uh, this was a consistent trope coming from, you know, from teachers, male and female. And this is important from both male and female teachers that when the boys, and they call them boys, now I'm saying boys, they're not the black men called boys. So I want to make the distinction. When these young boys came back from the bush after the, after the initiation into manhood, they come back as men in the communities, but they sit in the desks as boys, the young boys sitting next to young girls. And so when teachers indicated that they were acting in ways that were violent, uh, towards especially young girls, but also towards other boys. One a teacher this, you know, described it as, I fear because the way that, that, that student looks at me, I think he's going to kill me because how dare I speak to a man that way? Um, I'm using that as an illustration to indicate that these things sit within, uh, they sit at the foreground of people's minds in some of the most unexpected spaces, you know, in the, you know, in the country. And so there's an alertness to this that is, tan that is tangible. What is absent is a state-driven, programmatic assault. And I'm using a violent metaphor here to show the contradiction. But there has to be a coordinated, programmatic, state-driven, in conjunction with civil society, unions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, set of ideas and set of programs that that must begin to address this as long as as long as there's a concept of manhood and masculinity that opposes something gentle and something kind the cycle of violence is going to perpetuate itself um, and so instances of 16 days of activism etc cetera, etc cetera, are a drop in the ocean we need something a lot more programmatic and again it behoves people like us sitting here in this forum to be part of that initiation and part of that consistent um, attempt to get this done in, in our spaces and beyond. Um, thanks, uh, Eunice. Um, I know we're running out of time formally, but we've just got a couple of questions, so we may have to just try to address them briefly. Um, there is a question from Denise. Uh, um, I'm just going to read them out to save some time. Um, how does the current COVID crisis and concerns for the environment perhaps give an opportunity for a new ideological framing? And then the second question from Francis uh, Stevens says, I'm curious, do you think dismantling racial identities has the potential to further disempower or enact a violence on those with already subjugated identities? The idea that the privileged identities can say they are colorblind when the radicalized identity has always privileged them. Asim? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I don't mind taking a step, but Asim, yeah. No, no, you go for it. Uh, I, I quite enjoy listening to you. Okay, let's do, I mean, you know, the current COVID-19 crisis. I think across the globe, we had a, we had a moment um, in the early stages of COVID-19 when the possibility for the new was absolute. Um, we had a dismantling of this neoliberal framing of the world as something inevitable 
that was completely undone. Uh, public expenditure on a scale we'd never even thought about uh, was happening. Uh, this was Germany in 1945, after 1945, uh, state investment on a scale that we hadn't seen before. The moment has passed. Uh, in many senses, we were not able to seize, seize this moment. Uh, and I think we are back into a neoliberal framing, certainly in our country. Um, and we've got to recognize this moment as something lost, but there are lessons. We had the moment. In other words, the inevitability of a neoliberal framing and that neoliberal hegemony was shattered, was shattered for a long time, but it's also emblazoned itself on the hearts and minds of people. And I think it energizes a lot of us in terms of the way forward. I hope that that's you know, a piece of the puzzle perhaps. Uh, in terms of the dismantling of racial identities, yeah, I think, you know, as Cornell West indicates, part of the job is to systematically undo the kind of taken for granted um, veils of identity, I suppose, as teachers. We have to systematically erode that in our students. And I'm using teacher student as a metaphor for, you, you know, for working in a broader society. And you peel away at this and you cause people this, you know, discomfort, et cetera, et cetera. But the task then is to reconstruct along with people. And I think that for me holds as a metaphor for the kind of debate that you are raising, Francis. Um, the time is short. I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't want to overspeak. But thank you. Yeah, um, Azim, do you have any final words before I close the seminar? No, I think what we what we trying to do in our in our talk today was not necessarily to privilege race. What we were trying to do was to say that um, we are at a moment in our history where uh, race needs to be taken far more seriously. But not racing is in, in the form that, we, that we've uh, um, engaged with it in the past. Not race as a, a, as, um, a racial identity, etc. We have to understand how race works. And we haven't begun that, that, that task yet. We have to understand how it operates within the classroom, how it operates between the, in, the relationships between human beings in, in a society wrapped by, by this kind of violence. And what we're trying to say is that when you work on political economy, if you, if you fail to engage with the, one of those fundamental issues like race, then um, it's, it's unlikely that we can do anything meaningful um, in bringing about change. Great, thank you very much Azim and thank you very much Eunice for what I think was a really excellent uh, session. Um, next week's um, lecture, uh, reconnects with some of the issues that Nimi Hoffman's presentation last week dealt with uh, in relation to higher education, the society, survival of academics in a period of crisis, and we'll be focusing on academic repression and academic resist resistance in Turkey. Uh, so next week, Thursday 19th of November, same time, same link, uh, Academics for Peace and the Political Economy of Repression in Turkey's Higher Education Sector, and that will be led by Bidgud Kutan from the University of Sussex and Mehmet Ur from the University of Greenwich. Um, so please join us uh, on that session. Um, thanks again for some really fantastic uh, questions and engagement, great presentations, and uh, yeah, a real vindication of the value of you know exploring different dimensions. I think of this political economy discussion, and you know a very rich historicization that I think many of us really appreciated. So, so thanks very much, uh, Eunice and Azim, again for fitting this into your busy timetables, and see everybody very soon. Uh, have a good week, and thanks very much. Great. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.